Um, I'm just going to remind you where we are with Emma. I don't know why you would know, but um, she's just ended things with the Italian. Yes, <laughs> who reeked. <laughs> he reeked a possibility and a rage disorder. So Emma, once again, is a lonely, sober, alcoholic divorcee who's still painting her toenails. But uh, this time she puts on her best kitten heels and she hopes against hope to snag a man at a dreaded meditation meeting, something she really doesn't want to go to, but the guy's there, so she decides she'd better go. Um, the man that she meets there, of course, does not work out, and she's rather humiliated by the breakup of yet another relationship. So um, this man that she's humiliated by, it comes to be known as Blowjob Guy <laughs> for reasons that I will not speak here because I'm going to invite you to read the book and find that out. Um, but because of him, she escapes to a meditation retreat in Ojai where she dreams about a certain man, an onk. She has memories about her grandfather, Jess. And all of these things after the retreat is over lead her to, instead of doing her laundry and hanging out with her kittens, lead her to Mel's house, which is the man that she dreamt about. Mel was in the dream and he had said to her, everything is prepared, everything is ready, let me take care of this for you. And during the retreat, she tried to make friends with Mel, but he seemed very disinterested. But she was still curious, so she ended up finding out that the meditation meeting was at Mel's house. And she thought, well, I dreamt about him, I guess I should go. So we'll meet Mel. And then Trevor Tom is the meditation uh, Vedic initiator, the meditation guru, and he will be leading the meditation at this meeting. And then there's a young man named William, who is a young man that she met at the retreat who's very interested in her, but she's sure that he's just far too young. Uh, and then, of course, there's Grandpa Jess, and then we're going to meet Jess. So this is from a chapter called The Signs. I took off my shoes at the entrance of the Immaculate Craftsman tiptoed into Mel's foyer in Hancock Park, and feeling inadequate, called into the empty hallway. Hello? Mel answered from the back. I found him in a beautifully appointed chef's kitchen. The countertops, sinks, and table were immaculate. I made an attempt to chat, but like before, he was unresponsive. So I asked for the bathroom. At least it would pass the time. When I returned, he fussed with a bouquet of flowers until I asked, can I help you set up? If you want, he said, without making eye contact. I wondered for a brief moment if he had Asperger's. <laughs> in the living room, I opened fold-out chairs. Mel came in and without looking up, placed a vase of tulips next to Trevor's seat and disappeared. I threw my purse into a big stuffed chair at the back and sank in. He really knew how to make a girl feel invisible. Fifteen minutes later, the meeting was packed with unfamiliar people. I introduced myself to a pale, thin woman on my right. Leaning into the man next to her, assuming they must be together, I extended my hand. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm Jess. He was six foot tall, with shoulder length wavy brown hair, a strong jawline, Rock musician's five o'clock shadow, and grandpa's name, Dreamy. His hand touched mine and a shot of energy fired through me. That's the name, that's the name went thundering through my head. My eyes widened and I opened my, my mouth, but nothing came out. The way he shook my hand, I could sense that he wasn't with the reedy little thing next to him, <laughs> which was fine. <laughs> because I was already sure that she wasn't good enough for him. <laughs> My mind screamed again, the name, it's him. He was obviously waiting for me to speak, but the pulsing in my brain had me spinning. Sorry, uh, my name is Emma, I said again. Nice meeting you. He gave me a reassuring glance and took a seat. 
From my overstuffed chair against the wall, I surveyed the room. There were a number of good-looking men. He was definitely one of them. But it wasn't about that. When I shook his hand, I'd felt something. Trevor took his seat. One by one, he held each of us in his gaze, then whispered, shall we? We all took our cue to close our eyes, but I was restless. I tried to find my mantra, but really there was, I wanted to talk to Jess. Maybe I'd, I'd go right up to him after the meeting and, and, and say hello, fat chance. But there was something about him, a spark in his eyes, that feeling when he shook my hand. I took a breath, tried to focus, mantra, mantra. <laughs> Where was my mantra? It was nowhere. I fidgeted, buttoned and unbuttoned the side button of my pants. I decided that when this was over, I would get up, go for my shoes, and see if I could spot him. Trevor signaled the close of meditation, which seemed endless. I opened my eyes, and William, who must have come in late, walked over, jumped in my chair, and pushed me up against the left armrest. Is anyone sitting here? He flashed a big boyish grin. I moved as far to my left as possible. Jess was sitting directly in front of me, and I looked at him, telegraphing with my entire being. I am not with him. <laughs> Jess gave me a non-committal smile, and I was petrified. Maybe he thought I was taken. After the meeting ended, while Trevor took questions from the group, I extracted myself from the chair. See you later, I said to William, in my most casual tone, giving him a just friend's hug. I kept my upper body from touching. I turned to face the entry wall, slipped on my shoes when Jess came up from behind. Can I talk to you? Yes, I said a little too quickly. <laughs> Standing outside in the front of the house, I studied Jess's ring finger. He wasn't wearing anything. No telltale tan line either, but you never knew. How long have you been meditating? He asked. About a month. It's a whole new world for me. I s Barely knowing how to begin, I inched closer. How about you? Over a year now. I stared at him like a total dolt. Not an idea in my head. <laughs> he was tall. Jess had big shoulders, rugged good looks, and pale green eyes that held a bitter tenderness. When my wife left, it was hard. When a man talked about his ex, it could only go one way. I crossed my arms, ready for the inevitable sob story about a heartless bitch destroying a good man's life, and pretended to listen. I didn't see my daughter for years, but my ex is a good woman. He was emphatic, tapping on his chest, pointing to himself. I needed to rise. I needed to be the man she wanted me to be. I shook my head in disbelief. He continued, when I finally got the courage to visit, I went there to be of service, and I got my life out of it. Instead of feeling rejected, estranged from my daughter, hurt, that my ex had a new man and a baby with him. I saw my family expanding. Wow. My mouth dropped open. Men didn't say nice things about their exes. My ex certainly didn't. Wow. I whispered again, looking at him. There was a big, gorgeous heart beating inside that chest. Jess's eyes sparkled as he smiled and focused on my necklace. The onk you're wearing, it's exactly like one I lost. Yeah? I touched my throat. I hated losing it, but then I decided it was out there in the world doing its thing and it would come back if it were mine. He laughed, self-consciously. When I saw you wearing it, I thought for a minute, well, it's beautiful. He reached to touch it and... Feeling his fingers graze my neck, I held my breath. His touch was tender. I felt myself turn the chain of my necklace and open its clasp.
the dream about Mel, the, the crazy-ass moment with the masseur, Grandpa's name, the, the feeling when I shook Jess's hand, all pointing to me being here to give him back his onk. Like he understood, Jess bowed his head as I put the chain around. It didn't fit. I giggled when my fingers brushed his neck. Every fiber of me was tingling. Just one sec. I've got this, I said nervously. I was wearing another necklace with a longer chain, so I unhooked it and slipped the onk on. This time it fit. Thank you, he said, blushing. More, please. What? <laughs> you can only receive at the level you're willing to accept what's given. He fixed his eyes on mine. I'm practicing abundance. Oh, I said, breathing faster. No clue what he'd said. <laughs> but his smile was turning me on. Just then, the human embodiment of Jiminy Cricket walked past us toward the front door. His name was Stuart, and he was wearing a cardboard sign around his neck like a vagrant. Instead of saying homeless will work for food, his sign said more love. Delighted, I put my arm out for him to join us. You can't walk past wearing a sign like that and not tell me what it means. I was in a coffee shop, and there was a homeless guy sitting inside the door, and he was wearing a more love sign. I smiled, and he had this big, toothy grin, so I busted up. He took the cardboard from around his neck, handed it to me, and told me to wear it for five days. After five days, like he was a prophet or something, he said, watch for the miracles. Stuart waved his arms excitedly, so I took the sign and put it on. When he paused, both Jess and I leaned in and said, well, Jess's arm touched mine, and I tried to look cool, but my temperature rose. I never took it off, even put a plastic bag on it when I took a bath. My girlfriend took me back, and I, I applied to grad school, and I got into my first choice. He took a quick breath and added, oh, and I just got this incredible opportunity to play extreme sports with these guys I totally admire. All that in five days, Jess asked. Oh, I've been wearing it for five months. Seen a lot of miracles. Stuart called back as he walked to the door. Hey, stay here. I'll be back. When he returned, he produced two signs with strings and more love printed on the front. Starting tonight... Wear them for five days and watch the miracles. Maybe it was the thrill of meeting Jess, but I couldn't resist. We donned our signs and pleased, Stuart shook our hands. I've given these to seven people so far. Just paying it forward, spreading the word. He crossed the street and walking toward his car yelled, Watch for the miracles! Jess turned to me leaned into the shimmer of light from the street lamp, and his long hair covered his pale green eyes. His soft, full lips parted. Can I take you to dinner? You don't owe me anything. I stared at my feet. I wanted to go with him, but he was so handsome. He couldn't possibly want me. I was here to give him the onk, nothing more. He moved in closer. It's just that I love talking to you and I don't want to stop. Oh, I said, surprised. Me too. My cheeks were red as we walked to his car, and it wasn't the cool of the evening making them rosy. We wore our more love signs into Louise's on Larchmont and hardly noticed people staring. Jess talked about his spiritual journey mystics he'd seen, countries he'd visited, and I was fascinated. I didn't think about daddy or my ex, not once. There was a Hawaiian healer, a kahuna. The only word he chanted was love, and days later my heart opened up, he said. I stared at him from across the glass tabletop, waiting for the next detail, the next morsel to drop from his mouth. He wasn't showing off. He was pointing to something profound, and I had to touch him, let him know how much I was enjoying myself. I put my hand on his forearm, and electricity shot through me. Without thinking, I blurted, you're adorable, he was. 
While bussing empty tables and filling salt and pepper shakers, the waiters flashed so many long-suffering smiles that we got the point. We left. Jess drove me back to my car, and in front of Mel's house, in front, uh, Jess drove me back to my car in front of Mel's house, and inside his station wagon, we talked as the windows clouded with condensation. I watched his face in the wet glow of the streetlight, and already loved how the corner of his eye creased when he smiled. I wasn't the kind of gal to give out my phone number. The man always had to give his, but the more love club, the more love sign was hanging around his neck. I'll be at Mel's next Saturday. Maybe I'll see you, or I inhaled quickly, feeling faint, flipped the sign over, and wrote my number. Out of his car, I rested against my Prius when he put his arms around my waist. As he talked, he rocked me back and forth and leaned in. He didn't paw, didn't try to put his tongue down my throat. I was confused. He kissed me. It wasn't rockets going off in space. I recalled my therapist saying, I was wired to kiss psychotics. <laughs> <laughs> Told me to start kissing healthy men and do some rewiring. So while Jess kissed me with great care, no sparks, the therapist inside my head said, keep kissing, keep rewiring. I'll call. Jess said, and I wanted to believe him. He gave me one last hug and a respectful kiss. In my little hybrid, in the dark, hurtling through space, through Hollywood, and dimensions of reality, I barely remember driving home. Inside, I walked to the laundry room, opened my duffel, unpacked my footies, folded them, smelled the flannel one last time, and put them in the pile for goodwill. During the divorce, I'd watch TV, zipped up. No chance of dropping off the edge. Divorce was doable in yellow footies. Now, safe at last in the wide, wide world, I wouldn't need them. Falling asleep, body happy, floating, surreal. I saw Stuart's face the more love sign swinging as he walked to his car, calling out, watch for the miracles. The damn sign was poking my boobs as I drifted off. <laughs> so, yes. How, once you started writing, how long did it take you to finish? Well, I'm not finished. Um, it's been five years. And the original writing I wrote once I'd met Russ, I started meditating and everything started changing and I met Russ and I met this crazy guy who said, where the sign? And my whole life literally in the blink of an eye changed and I realized I have to start writing this down. This is, this is crazy what's happening for me. My life is just one miracle after the next. Um, and as you can see, I'm not estranged from my children anymore. <laughs> right? I mean, they're here. Um, so it's one of, the, one of the millions of miracles is one of my favorite. So um, I wrote it out, and it was horrible. It was a diary. It was awful. And, I, and uh, the girl, Diane, who had to go, she was in the workshop. I found myself a workshop, a writer's workshop, and kept workshopping it and workshopping it and workshopping it until it was actually of some literal value, you know, could actually be read. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think right up until the end, until we you know, published this particular edition, I kept changing it, little, little things. Yeah, so five years. Maybe if I were any good at it, it would take me a little less time. <laughs> but I was a newbie. Yeah. Have you ever seen Stuart again? Um, there's more of Stuart in the book. <laughs> so you can't answer that. I'm not going to. <laughs> but perhaps, perhaps I did. Yes. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? Have you started the second book? I have, yes. Thank you for asking. Yeah, I have. Uh, right now, the working title, and that'll probably take me another three to five years to do, the working title is India is Burning. Um, 
the main character, Emma, makes a commitment to uh, go to India. And in India, she's going to do a lot more transforming. Um, so I've started that. And, and it may be um, a series that is in three. We'll have to see. But yeah, I have started the next one. It starts at the airport oh, on the way to India. Hmm. Yep. And I think she may not have her passport with her. <laughs> so that's maybe how it's going to start. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you all. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. Oh, thank you.